Coming to you live from Studio B at KOPN, it is the Sticky's Cabana Podcast. How y'all doing, folks? It's uh, Chris here with uh, Sticky's Cabana, the podcast. Um, I'd like to go around here and introduce some people, and unfortunately, my little fuzzy pal over here has lost his voice a little bit, or a little upset, but uh, go ahead and introduce yourself there, man. I am your furry pal, Topher. Hi, everybody. Yeah, can't do the voices this week. Sinuses are all messed up, so. It's a no good. Lovely Missouri weather changing. Yeah. Across the table from us here. Yeah, d- I guess it would be Kim. Yeah. It must be appropriate again, yeah. That's the appropriate thing, anyway. <laughs> this The behaved name is Kim. Come around to the van and you find out what the heck else they call me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> And then, All kinds of things. Yeah. And then to her right is our guest of the day. Nick Boggs, uh, Soul Daisy, Surviving the Fall, Storm the Giant, those bands you probably know me from. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So we'll get kind of into this a little bit. Um, so, uh, of course, today we were going to have um, Nick and Maddie with Soul Daisy come in. And then Maddie had something come up, I'm sure. And Maddie's got a lot going on. Yeah. Um, she uh, she wanted to be here. She couldn't. Um, as you guys know, she has a uh, nonverbal autistic son, and that's that's a full time job in itself. Yeah. And so for her to do anything, the fact that she does as much as she does is amazing. She's she's superwoman. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I've worked with uh, kids with autism, and I also have friends that have uh, developmentally disabled children that they care for, and. I know what it's like to be a caregiver who's not related, not, you know, emotionally invested. But, yeah, that's a, a huge job for a parent. Sounds from the outside. It's definitely yeah. Okay. It is. It is. And, and it's to, not all parents push like that. To pursue music full time because, yeah. I mean, she's got so much content that's online. Mm-hmm. Uh, Soul Daisies, I believe, on TikTok. I don't normally plug the social media. <laughs> but uh, but that's what I we're here for. I think, right, I think it's Madison sharp music and that's on tiktok the soul daisy is on facebook okay what else is there any other social i don't do a lot of social media (laughs) instagram instagram i know she's on instagram yeah i think that's also madison sharp music the soul daisy madison sharp music it's the same thing so what projects are you into right now so it's been actually uh a pretty fun year 2023 uh 2023 was uh musically uh, started out with Surviving the Fall. We uh, we recorded a single. Peyton, release that single, bro. You pay, you paid for it, man. Release it. Do what you got to do. Uh, finished up with them guys. It was all amicable. We all love each other. Uh, We've been doing it for eight years, and it just didn't uh, just didn't work out. Then uh, did Soul Daisy and kind of also like free agency because you're a baseball fan. It was kind of like a free agency tour i got to uh jam at pit fest we we got to jam uh played bass for like three hours i got to do a uh, guitar for like an hour yeah and traded some licks with logan lashley which i've known logan lashley since we were kids so that was awesome to you know go lick for lick with him i mean he's miles better than me but it was just cool to be able to do that and then play bass for like three hours that was fun i've got to jam with some other bands uh, and just other people and do some stuff. And it's just been real fun. Um, the band I'm focusing on right now, besides Soul Daisy, which Soul Daisy doesn't really do much in the winter. Um, but you guys had them at the Battle of the Bands. It was uh, Ancient Stone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Those okay. guys. Yep. Those guys. And uh, that connection is from Hero Adam Steele, the singer. Um, when Storm the Giant, I mentioned that at the beginning uh years ago that's where logan josh and i all started after all those guys had gone and i was trying to continue with it before the surviving the fall thing happened uh it was bridger creed from con man economy shout out to con man economy those guys rock uh bridger creed myself and adam uh steel yeah we played i think two or three shows I think they were all at Bud's place in Moberly, but we had a bunch of stuff set up before COVID hit, and yeah, we had to cancel everything. We it was going to be a great breakout year, and then from there, you know. But right now, Ancient Stone, we're I don't think we're keeping that name. I don't know if we're going to go back under the Storm the Giant 
all that stuff's up for up in the air. Yeah, but uh. Nature. It was cool to jam with those guys. I didn't know because I'm always nervous. I mean, I've been doing this for 19 years, but I'm still nervous about stuff like that, especially when I know people, but I don't know people because I knew of them. And then a really funny part is uh, the bass player, John Johnson. He was like, I got a Nick Bog story. So when I showed up, I was like, what was your Nick Bog story? And he said, man, about, you know, 18 years ago, I got a phone call from this kid who had seen my, because back then you put flyers, that's how old it was. There wasn't Facebook to you know post stuff on. You you just flyers at your local music store. And uh, he's like, I got a call from this kid, Nick Boggs. And we talked about music and whatnot and joining each other's band and, you know, never really, never really heard from him about it again. And I was like, no joke. I was like, that's awesome. I was like, so, I told him, I was like, in the back of my mind, for the last 18 years, I wondered what happened to that bass player that I talked to when I was just a brand new guitar player, didn't really know much. And so that was just a cool little fun story to, like, circle back. Yeah. Cool. Everything circled back on itself. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And those guys, it, it's a little raw, but we're, we're working our way. Well, They're a pretty go. good group of guys. There you go. You got anything for it here? Uh you're just kind of, yeah, fl- going with the yeah. flow today. What about you, Miss Kim? Actually, most of the questions I thought of just popped right out of his mouth. Yeah, I know, I know. He's, he's, <laughs> you he go right into it. I mean, it's like, hey. Well, look, you want to get into what you guys kind of got maybe going on? Yeah, well. Maybe. Like I had said in the first podcast, is Scotty and I are talking about reforming another project scotty from the bomb the band of misfit boys that i was a part of for four years but uh i approached nick about playing bass with us and be honored that would be cool because i mean not only you do you play bass but you also play guitar yep vocals vocals uh, harmonica. I'm actually pretty decent at harmonica. Uh, well, blues harmonica. Don't ask me to do anything good. I can, I can do blues <laughs> harmonica. Uh, so, I, and then drums. I enjoy drums. I wouldn't say I'm a drummer. I'm a guy who owns a drum set. Don't. Yeah. That, that, would, like be, that would be yeah. that'd be a dishonor uh, to drummers. But pretty much just a jack of all trades. Love music. Like I said, I've been doing it 19 years. Yeah. Yeah. Started. I was 11 or 12, I think 12 maybe. And I remember, you know, getting close to your birthday. uh, My mom was at, what do you want for your birthday? And I don't know why. I don't know why. I was like, guitar. And I had been coming into my own in music. uh, Because when you're younger, you listen to whatever your parents do, your grandparents do, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I still love that stuff to this day. uh, From the last podcast we did, Mm -hmm. Duke Ellington. You know, Dizzy Gillespie, Nat King Cole, uh, Ella Fitzgerald, all those guys. Love it. All that stuff. But then I was getting older and start to listen to my own stuff and listen to, like, more modern rock. Because I'd listen to classic rock and, you know, jazz and blues. I still love blues to this day. But was developing my own taste for music. And I was like, want a guitar. Probably what a lot of teenage boys say. Yeah. Um, so... We went to it was either Sam Goody or On Q, local store in town. We didn't go to the music store for some reason. We went there, and we bought me a silver tone Les Paul. Oh, right handed. Um, so you had to flip it. Well, we didn't know at the time. This is this <laughs> this is the fun part of the story. This is just the beginning. This will. So get the guitar. It comes with what most starters things do: strap, picks. When it comes with a Video, VHS, that's how old this is. VHS, put it in there, and I'm trying and whatnot, and we give me some guitar lessons. At, uh, back then, it was Palin Music Store in Moberly. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, Clint Thompson was the manager. Shout out to Clint. Love you, buddy. If you ever see this, I might send you the link to it, so I hope you see this. I love you, and uh, you'll understand in the story. First guitar teacher was Doug Drage, or I can't ever pronounce his last name right. Um Lessons for a month. And what we were starting was chords. And then uh, Johnny be good. That da, 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 da. Two yeah. hammer, four, two hammer. Da, 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 that. And I mean, 
I'm trying. I would go to school. I'd get done with school, get done with sports, and then I'd lock myself in my room and I'd play. I'd play and play and play. Whatever I learned that week, I would just play. And a month in, my guitar teacher's like, hey, after lesson, uh, stick around. I want to talk to your, uh, want to talk to your mom. And so get done with lesson. He's like, hey, can I talk to you? He's like, I, I don't want to sound rude, but I don't want to waste any more of your guys' money and my time. I just don't think it's really for him. My mom's like, well, he's practicing. Like, he's not lying to you. He comes home and he practices. And my grandma, she's there too as well because she used to give me rides. She's like, he practices. When he comes over to our house, that's all he does. He plays that damn guitar. And this is why I say shout out to Clint. Clint's like, well, look, before we, before we, you know, stop this, um, do you happen to be left-handed? <laughs> and, you know, light bulb, uh, left-handed. I play baseball left-handed, basketball, you know, everything. Left-handed. I'm a left-handed person. He goes and grabs a uh, Fender Strat. He says, play what you've been working on on this. And I sit down, plug in, and it was like talking, walking, breathing. It was so natural. And that saved it. Clint saved it. And nice. from there, it was just downhill <laughs> because I fell in love with it. It's uh, music is my life. I took lessons there forever. Um, and then nine months in, I think I got my first band with them. They also, this is how I met Logan Lashley. Shout out to Logan Lashley and Lifeline. Love you guys. Appreciate you. Is they would take all the kids that got lessons and they did, it was called School of Rock or University of Rock, something like that. They put them together and formed bands. And that's how I got to know all these guys and network is because everybody took lessons. It was a group and we would go and play places. Mm -hmm. And it was super cool. I thought about bringing the book in because I got one. But that's how I cut my teeth is doing that. And we all had a great time. We'd play fairs and anywhere that would have us because we're all kids. We were playing for free. Uh, and Palin Music Store was providing the all that stuff. But we were we were paying monthly. It was like, I think at the time it was like 50 bucks a month to do that through Palin and, you know, four people per band. There's 10 bands. Wow. You know, somebody's yeah. making some money. Yeah. So like I said, we play all that. And I did that for several years, several years. We were called uh, Captain Crunch and the Serial Killer. <laughs> Shout out to Adam Leeser, childhood best friend. He played bass through the majority of that. And that was uh that was a, that's a fun little side story to this whole thing is, um, I'd, I'd take lessons. I'd come home and show Adam, cause he played guitar too. He got his guitar from his uncle, and his uncle's pretty good guitar player. Uh, and then I was doing the band thing. He wasn't, cause he you know I gave him my lessons, so he didn't really have any affiliation with Palin Music Store. And they had just moved to Columbia. And a lot of people didn't go. They didn't transition from Oberly to Columbia. And we needed a bass player. And I remember coming back from, we had a meeting or whatever at Palin with the, you know, the director, figure out, hey, who's going to be, because I think, yeah, nobody transferred in my band. The original one before Captain Crunch of the Zero, we didn't have a band name. We were like five songs in, going to go play a show. And then when we moved, we were going to do the opening because they're going to have all the bands play at the opening. Right. Palin. Well, none of my guys went. I didn't have enough time to get stuff situated. So we were trying to recruit as everybody else is uh, doing that. And so I remember coming home. And I was, I was like, man, we really need a bass player. Like, I've got shows. They've got everything booked. We've got the place. I just need a bass player. And to Adam's credit, he normally in life is so cheap about everything. The next day, he went to Palin in Columbia, had his, this is how young, had his uh, stepdad drive him to Columbia, bought a Fender bass. It was black that had the skull. It was a Squire circa 05, just standard bass, and then a, like a Rumble 15, good practice yeah. amp. And he joined the band, and he's the one who came up with the band name, Captain Crunch and the Serial Killers, and all that stuff, and we played shows forever. Uh, one of the coolest ones is we play the Municipal Auditorium. It holds like 200 people in Moberly. So it's like it's like hometown for us. You know, yeah. it's, we're from Higby, but it's hometown for us. Yeah. We had all our friends there. We were in eighth grade or something. All our friends, and we were friends with the girls too. We had them begging their moms. So we had 
almost all of our class. We had a bunch of people there, massive turnout. And it was just so cool that to do that. And then one of the uh, two of the cool things that I remember from that show, one's funny and one I think is awesome. The funny one is a couple months beforehand, my mother had bought me a wireless. And back then, those wirelesses weren't that great. Mm -hmm. This was an Audio Technica that you had to plug in to your guitar, put the strap on the strap, and then you had to set the box and antenna on your amp and then the have somebody antennas. mess with the antennas as you yeah. played and knew where you were going to be. So in between songs, I go to the back because I do the promotional thing every time. As I've, you guys seen at the cabana, do a lot of the talking, a lot of the hollering, whatnot. Go in the back, grab some shirts. I go in the back, flip it off. Grab some t-shirts, go out, do some talking, throw some t-shirts out. We go into uh, Living After Midnight, Judas Priest. And um, at the time, we didn't have a second guitar player, so the director was playing guitar with us. And we talked that whole week because it was a new song. He's like, you going to play the solo or not? I was like, oh, I don't think I'm going to do a solo. He's like, all right, cool. I won't play the solo either. We'll just we'll play the same thing. So we go into the song, we do the song, and we finish the song up, and I go to click my thing off to go back to grab more t-shirts to do more talking, to try to fill time, and it's already off. I was off the whole time. Thank God we had decided to have the director be the backing guitar, or we'd have gone into it and be like... <laughs> so that's the funny one to that. Uh, the cool one is the auditorium is like it's beveled, so it goes up. And our last song was Bang Your Head. Uh, well, Metal Health, Bang Your Head, whatever you want to call it. Uh, right. Quiet Right. Quiet Right. Yep. And so the ending, it's just an A chord held out. Well, I, Angus Young, that I went off the stage <laughs> all the way up to the top. And uh, cool thing about that, I didn't know it at the time, but the guy that I, because I met, I locked eyes with the guy at the top. And I was like, ah, and then ran back down and then did a spin. Well, the guy, I, the guy I locked eyes with ended up being a buddy of ours that we call Wolfie. Uh, Baron, I can't remember his first name right now. Shows how much of a friend I am. But uh, it's just cool that I was telling that story one day to Peyton. Because sometimes people think you lavish. And he's like, no, I was there. You really, he's like, you, I was the guy that made contact with you at the top. I was like, no shit. <laughs> and so I looked at Peyton. I was like, see, story's real. I'm not lavishing. You know, came down, did the whole spin. Super fucking cool. Uh, that was a really fun time. I think we did it from like, 13 to 16, I think is when Adam stopped. But the whole time, like, looking over at your best friend, like, fucking doing it, man. Like, we're playing covers, but we're fucking doing it. Yeah. Like, that's always cool. And to look back now, that's super cool. Uh, we had uh, a lot of lineup changes, always a lot of lineup changes, uh, constantly going through singers. Um, but then he got a girlfriend, and Adam will admit this now, uh, he got a girlfriend, just kind of got disinterested. And at that point, I was starting to feel the burnout. But I kept going because uh, the guy that was directing it, they kicked him out for something. I don't know what happened there. But he started to do it at his place. Uh, and he was like, hey, if you want to keep going, we can keep going. I was like, man, Adam just left. I really... We keep just going through singers. I don't really. He's like, how about this? We find a bass player. He said, I'll do drums. You sing and play and just do blues. Hmm. I was like, what? He's like, you sing and play and just do blues. I was like, no, man, I, I can do backup. I don't have a, like, I don't have a great voice. I don't have like a dog shoe voice, but like, I don't have a great voice. <laughs> uh, I, I can fake my way through it. He's like, no, no. He's like, you can do blues. He's like, Steve Ray Vaughan. He's like, listen to any Steve Ray Vaughan song. How many lyrics are in a song? He's like, but he's like, besides, you know, uh, Pride and Joy. Yeah. He's like, Texas Flood. How many, how many lyrics are in that? Not that many. Yeah. He's like, you can do that. And I was like, okay. So we did that. And that, that became work. That became work. But we were playing pretty good shows. One of the big ones we did was Anchor Fest, Centralia. But I was getting burned out. 16 turned 17, turned to, hey, what are you going to do? And my senior year of high school, I just, I was done. I was done. I was burnt out. I was done. I didn't pick up a guitar. I took an acoustic with me to college, 
and I did some playing and singing every now and then when I felt, but I didn't really play. I thought it was a year when I used to tell this story, but it was almost, I think, two and a half. Dang. So it was um, 2011 to, I think, 2013, 2014 is when I started to get back into it. But I didn't. I was just burned out, and that's the one. Of the, that's one of the big things I. Uh, I was telling the kids from Con Cannon, uh, Kai Alexander, who Kai, shout out to you, brother. Shout out. I bow down. He's fourteen, I think, thirteen or fourteen. This kid's a monster on drums. You guys have listened to him. You guys yeah. have seen him. The kid's a monster. I've got to jam with him. I've got to do a show with him. That was part of the free agency tour. Love that kid. That kid is great. And did you guys see that purple suit he was wearing at yeah. the Midmo Rock show? Yeah, styling. Um, but that's why I was warning those guys is like, Hey, when it doesn't become fun, speak up, speak up. Like they're having a blast right now. Yeah. But if it ever becomes not that way, I told him, I was like, speak up mm-hmm. because I didn't, I just went and I was burnt the hell out when I was done. Like I said, two and a half years to something I love to this day. I, I have to play, even if it's five minutes at the end of the night, hidden in the bathroom, you know, because I'm dad now and I've got a daughter and a <laughs> wife and everything. But two and a half years, I didn't do, and I went to college, came home, worked, just was life. And then uh, I got in a car wreck and broke my ankle. That's why I walk with a little bit of a limp. I just had it slapped in a cast and said surgery. I just thought that was you. Right? <laughs> I just thought you were fat in it. Yeah. Uh, my, my thought went, yeah, this is when you all go, Kim. <laughs> uh, so I was laid up for a couple months, and the insurance check came in. And I was laid up for a couple months, and when you have a lot of time on your hands, you start to think of the stuff you miss and stuff you love and stuff you want to do. And at the time, my buddy's girlfriend's brother was doing a band called uh, Midnight Hour, and they were pretty big. They're out of St. Louis. They played Pops. They uh, actually won the Pops contest in 2015 or 16 and got to play the Point Pops. Fest. Yeah, Point Fest at the Pop stage. Yeah. Um, so I, I was going to those shows, and to me, I like going to like Point Fest. That's great, but I I get that drive and that love from seeing local guys mm-hmm. yep. for some reason. And Same so here <laughs> they were right. Those uh, shout out to your local venues. <laughs> Those guys start. I started getting that love back, and then at the time, uh, Sarah, uh, she's now in Cost of Desire. Shout out to Cost of Desire. Check them out on Spotify. They just dropped a bunch of stuff. Check them out on Facebook. Book them if you got a place. Book them. They're amazing. Ask Mad Existence. Oh, they also have stuff on Spotify. Check them out. Check them out. Yeah, they just dropped a new... Yeah, they just yeah. dropped some stuff, too. Those yeah. guys are super cool. Anyways, uh, Sarah, who was in, uh, who's in Cost of Desire now, was in a band originally called uh, Four on the Floor and then Steel Tin Man. Mm-hmm. Um, I bounced for their first show. I did the door and bounced, and that really made me, because their guitar player is a good guitar player, uh, but he was he was raw, and I'm like, I, I could do that. And this, I still, I hadn't really played much at the time. Right. And so, but I was like, I can do that. And so um, they rotate, change to Steel Tin Man, add people in and out. Noah Pitney was a drummer for him. Uh-huh. I know. Uh, so that started, I was like, okay, I'm, I really want to get back into it. Then they had a falling out of whatever. So the bass player was Bill Spire. He owned Computer Guru and Moberly. And he uh, he had the building. He was the guy who had the, the PA and the building and the, the contacts. So I was like, hey, you and me, let's do it. Uh, I had that insurance money, so I bought a guitar, really nice one, bought an amp, and would finish work, go over to his place, and I was like, really don't want to do this, but I got to get back in because nobody really knew me. Yeah. Logan was, you know, off doing Logan things <laughs> and everybody else was kind of like gone. They were either a lot older than me and was married and had kids at the time or they were, you know, in college somewhere else. A lot of people were like, who? Though I had been, you know, I'd spent the last, you know, five years playing somewhere. I mean, hadn't done anything for at that time two and a half years but before that i was active from 13 to 17 yeah so but 
if you're not doing anything, nobody knows who you are. Mm-hmm. So I had to reestablish myself, which was weird. And it took some time because I still had that, well, hell, I've played to, you know, a couple hundred people at a show. I'm, I'm hot shit. I, <sighs> I'll admit it to this day, and that was one of the biggest things of when we started Storm the Giant, the original thing with Logan Bailey, Josh Bailey, and them. Uh, I was a prick. I didn't see it back then because you can't see the forest for the trees, but I've had to work on that ego for years. That's why I'm as try to be as humble as I am now. I hope I am uh, as humble as I am now. Uh, but was going through that, going through the growing pains of that with Bill Spires, and finally one night. We were supposed to have band practice. It was like 7 o'clock. We were, every night was supposed to be at like 7 o'clock or whatever. And it was colder than shit. And I drove over to Computer Guru. Doors locked. Lights are on. Doors locked. Call Bill. No Bill. Text Bill. No Bill. Call Computer Guru. No Bill. I'm like, the motherfucker's at the bar. Because he was a drunk. Um... Uh, so I go up there, he's there, and I'm like, I didn't say nothing. Didn't I wasn't going to, I just had the confirmation, so I was done. But I still wanted to, now I had to figure out what the hell I was going to do. And so, still just hanging out. I'm writing, practicing, taking lessons. At the time, I was taking lessons from Tanner Jones. The Comancheros, Tanner Jones, love you, buddy. Uh, I was taking lessons from him, trying to get better. One random night going to the Wabash, Brian Malazzo was there. To Brian's credit, Brian doesn't get enough credit. Brian, if you ever watch this, I'm sorry, buddy, and I love you. He played music, and we kind of knew each other, ran in the same circles. So that night I see him there. He's like, Nick, hey, what's going on, buddy? I'm like, hey, man, how's it going? He's like, hey, I'm moving back soon. I'm going to start a band. Been doing music long enough. I've heard that. You've done me. You, you've yeah. heard that. You know, so I, in one ear, out the other, but I'm friend, talk to him, whatnot. I'm like, yeah, man, you move back, holler at me. A couple weeks later, seeing him at a house party, picking up a friend. Hey, Nick, what's going on, man? I'm moving back, blah, 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 blah. We're going to start a band. Like, yeah, man, you move back, just holler at me. Uh, I'd say a couple months go by, and I'm drinking at the Wabash, just, just hanging out. And walks Brian. He's like, Nick, what's going on, man? I was actually going to hit you up. This, is, this actually makes it a lot easier. I move back, going to start a band. I have a having auditions tomorrow. I'm like, cool, sweet. What time do you want me to be there? And he's like, oh, let's just, let's, uh, do you live close? Let's just go hang out real quick and see what's up real quick. I'm like, yeah, I actually just live three blocks straight down the street. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, let me finish this, pay the tab and we'll go. Pay the tab, walk outside, it's raining. So I remember it vividly. We book it down to my house, three blocks. <laughs> I was young, but it was still three blocks. I mean, just going. Uh, get there, grab the acoustic, because I'm not setting everything up. It's late at night. I'm not setting all that shit up. Grab the acoustic, and I just start playing. I strum three or four chords, and he goes, yep, yeah. we're good. I'm like, okay. He's like, I still want you to do the, uh, come to the auditions tomorrow. I'm like, cool. We're just we're audition drummers, bass players, what up? He's like, yeah, because he was a guitar player and singer. So the next day... Uh, he's like, hey, we'll just come pick you up. I'm like, okay. So they come pick me up. It is a guy named Justin Inyart, the original, original singer of Storm the Giant. Uh, Peyton. Peyton's at the time, well, not at the time, girlfriend. Eventually became girlfriend, now ex-girlfriend. Uh, but friend, we'll just call her Butterfly. Uh, <laughs> and uh, like I said, Peyton, Butterfly, Justin Inyart, and Brian. He's like, hey, man, we're here to pick you up. And I was like, cool. Is these guys the audition? He's like, yeah. So we get to Brian's house, which is his dad's house. And his dad had a music room. Uh, I love his dad. His dad's amazing. Uh, Chris Malazzo Sr., hell hell of a player. Amazing heart player. I got to jam with him when we did the benefit uh, for Katie Brockmeyer. Um, anyways, back to the story. Uh, they were all singers. So it's me, guitar, Brian, guitar, and singing. Peyton, Butterfly, and Justin Inyart were all singers. So I was like, what the fuck? Because I thought I had like a sure thing. This guy kind of sold me on it. So I was like, well, what the hell do we do? So we're like, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, we're all in the band. We'll, we'll figure it out. So I go home and 
looking and a couple weeks go by and we're like hey we're just gonna stick with one singer kind of thing so it's justin with malazzo doing some backup or whatever so i'm flipping through facebook trying to find a drummer i'm just looking looking through and this is 2015 so there's a little bit of like post stuff but facebook wasn't the gigantic thing yet um and i just happened to see this guy i'm friends with on facebook his profile picture has him and a drum set. I hit him up, and you guys have heard this story because it's from the first podcast I did. I said, hey, man, I know we don't know each other, but I'm looking for a drummer. And it was Logan Bailey because he hit me back up thinking I was Nick Gamble, the rapper. He's like, yeah, man, love rap. I'm like, cool, <laughs> I'm trying to make rock band. So that's how we found Logan. Um, we did a jam out at um, Brian's dad's other house. It was out in the middle of uh, BFE in between Higby and Harrisburg. And we jam there, and it's dark. We can't see nothing. It's a porch light. And so Logan's, like, drumming in the dark. <clears throat> I'm trying to play in the dark. At the time, Peyton is still a singer. Peyton's, Peyton was the dirty vocals of screaming because he's really good at it. Um and that's what Logan said he fell in love with, was the, the sound of the guitar. At the time, I had a custom ESP pink telly that was the pickups in it were gnarly. I mean, gnarly. I wish I still had it. I uh, I gave it back to its original owner, Ed Stanley, the manly Ed Stanley. Uh, show me guitar. It's another plug. That one's free. This one's free, Ed. Love you. Uh, Our sponsors. Absolutely. And so that's the guitar I had at the time. And so from there, we're playing because we don't have a bass player, but we'll figure it out. So thank, I don't know if the bass player came in before we got Josh. But anyways, one night we're having practice and like Justin, the original singer, is just eating shit. I love you, Justin. You'll never see this. I love you, but you suck as a singer. Uh, <laughs> I mean that with all the love. He's a friend of mine. We, we hung out more than anybody, him and I, besides Brian. Uh, hung out. I went to his Dirty 30 in Kansas City. I mean, you know, some crazy shit happened there. But he was like, he wasn't doing great. And so Josh, who had been sitting on the porch the whole time, just comes in and he starts singing. And then we jam with Josh a little bit at the end of it. And I'm like, I'm looking at Malaz and I'm like, this guy. Not knowing the whole time, this was Logan's plan the whole time. <laughs> uh, so... Then I was like, hey, Logan, Lo what, what about your brother? So it's like the next day or something, we hang out. We're going to go hang out. Or the next weekend, we were going to go hang out with Josh. Because Josh like, I got a shit ton of songs wrote. And we ended up hanging out and hitting it on. I mean, Josh and I, I've never had more chemistry with somebody writing than Josh. We're, I mean, just so much. We love the same hobbies, interests. He's literally my little brother. No matter what happens, no matter what goes on, that's my little fucking brother. So we hit it off. We eventually phase out Justin, put in Josh. Then we get a bass player. We find the bass player from Craigslist, which is ironic when I talk about the ending of the bass player. Uh, found him on Craigslist. Malazzo gave him the wrong weekend, so he shows up at Logan and Josh's house in Rennick. He drove all the way from Columbia the weekend before. We beg him to come back next week, and he does. And the moment he comes back, we're like, if he's half as good, we're hiring him because he showed back up. Ends up being what we thought at the time pretty good. So we hire him full band. Practice, practice, practice. Get our first gig is we're going to headline. Um, what, what was that damn? Barn Bash. There it is. I'm glad I didn't hesitate for too long. Uh, Barn Bash, which was a huge party in between Higby and Huntsville on, it's like 2432, kind of road 2432. It's uh, out by the pig farm, out that way. Um, that was a massive, massive party every year. Bands played. Uh, Steel Tin Man did one year. Rain, they played in the barn. Noah was playing drums that time. Um, so we got to headline that, which we thought was cool. It's cool to say. But in reality, we went on at 10 o'clock at night, and everybody's already drunk and hammered drunk. You want to <laughs> you want to be one of the first bands. So that was a cool lesson for us to be like, we never want to headline again. That's why we always told you guys, let us open. We had the mentality of not, not disrespectfully, but top that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
So we did that, and then we disbanded the first... Well, we didn't disband. Logan left the first time. We replaced Logan with everybody. Noah Pitney, Levi Farkins. I mean, just so many, so many people. Then that went away. We came back for a little bit as uh, The Last of Us, which was a weird name to go by because it's a video game. And that was... (laughs) Logan, Josh, uh, Trevor, and I. Trevor's the bass player. And then that disbanded again. And then that's when I was still doing uh, Storm the Giant, still trying to keep that going, because that went forever from 2015 to 19. I think COVID killed it. 2019, 2020, uh, COVID killed it. Um, So we're trying, it's just me and the bass player, Trevor, who over time became a really close friend. He'd come over and hang out at the house. Uh, you know, got to meet his daughter, hang out with his daughter, Charlie, meet his wife, became real close friends with him. And then we found Bridger Creed from Con Man Economy. Again, shout out Bridger Creed, Con Man Economy. Uh, and then Adam Steele, hero, uh, who I had known, but not really like known and known. And right. nowadays, like a brother, uh, we have, we each have a daughter so close in age and that's, that also helps that bond. Uh, but it went well because Hero's got that rock vocal. So to go with the heavy guitar is, is you know, that. So it was it, it was different than Josh. I was so used to Josh. Josh is amazing. The fact that he can play and sing, play guitar and sing, play bass and sing. Yeah, underrated. To anybody underrated. That do that. Well, and I always said, especially when Wyatt was in the band, uh, I was like, I'm just happy to be here because I'm the I'm the least talented guy in the band. I, you know, just happy to be here. It's kind of like patting your head and rubbing your tummy at the same time. Hey, yeah, I still can't do that. Hard, really? That is so easy. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm so going through that, had a lot of songs wrote. Uh, like I said, we did a couple shows and then COVID hit. And then Bridger's like, hey, I'm going to go back to college. This is the time to do it. So then we're out of drummer. Couldn't do nothing for the longest time because of COVID. So I told Hero, I was like, hey, man, I think um, we can continue to try. You can look for a drummer, but I think I'm I'm going to take some time. Okay. And, and speaking of taking some time, we're going to take a short break so that the audience can hear a word from our sponsor. Hi, I'm Christy Lockwood, a licensed real estate agent with Iron Gate Real Estate. If you are looking to sell or purchase a home in the mid-Missouri area, I would love to assist you in that process. You want to give me a call? 573-239-4401. I'd be more than happy to meet with you and see how I can assist you. And we're back. And please, since you're seeing us on YouTube, I'm going to mention those normal things. Please like, subscribe, comment below. Good, bad, ugly, otherwise, we don't care. We like comments. We like comments. Definitely, definitely. Bring them on. And if you don't want to miss the rest of our episodes, hit that little bell icon thingy down there at the bottom. Check them all. Check. I forget what the three options are, but, you know, check the bell. Make it go ding-a-ling. And if you don't see us popping up there, you might want to see if maybe uh, you got unsubscribed. It happens sometimes on YouTube, you know. Yeah, the algorithm does its thing. I've been unsubscribed from so many channels that I follow. I've got to check every time I watch Mm -hmm. one of the new videos. definitely want them to to stay subscribed and stay alerted. I'm constantly on YouTube, so I always know what I'm subscribed to. (laughs) Yep. But before the break, we were talking with Nick here, and uh, you know where you kind of were there? Yeah, so I believe uh, 2019, the uh, going into 2020, uh, the COVID really killed it. So uh, all our shows were canceled. We did three, pretty much all at Bud's Place. I'm pretty sure I said that. Uh, COVID hit, had to cancel everything. Bridger was like, hey, I'm going to go to college. And... I was like, Hero, you can look for a drummer, but we're, uh, I'm just going to take some time. Around that time as well, um, and Trevor uh, got arrested. <laughs> he, uh, it, it's sad. Uh, so this guy that I had known at the time four or five years had become like a brother to me, like I said earlier in the podcast. He, uh, he got arrested. He... Uh, I don't know what happened to him. He 
but he ended up uh, molesting his daughter hmm. and ran back to, uh, I think, Tennessee or something like that, where his parents live, came back, turned himself in. I've never been arrested. Uh, oh, and so that that just, and it broke all of us, because at the time, uh, like I said, I wasn't really, I wasn't in a band with Logan or Josh. I don't know if we were, everything's always been mute, uh, you know, uh, copacetic, but I don't even, I don't know if we were like talking, talking about it. I'd shared the news with them, let them know, and it broke all of us because Trevor, he was a clean cut, good looking guy, you know, military veteran, college educated. He worked, uh, he worked for the, uh, the state of Missouri as an auditor. Mm. Um, he had everything going for him, married, beautiful kid, and so for that, it. Kind of really messed me up, and so when that happened, everything. So I just taking a break. Was I softly looking, but taking a break? Yes. Um, and then I get uh, hit up by Josh, and at the time, Lifeline uh, did a yearly charity show for uh, Coyote Hill, I believe it is, or um, and they did that in Moberly uh, at the Great Room, and he hit me up and he said, "Hey, man." Um, you still play in doing that? I was like, yeah, yeah, man. You know, how are you? You know, pleasantries. Uh, he said, Wyatt is sick. If we need to, would you be cool with filling in? I said, yeah, yeah, sure, man. Anything you need. And he sent me the list of songs and their songs from, uh, that Josh wrote. So I knew them already because Josh and I played there. They were things he wrote. Um, uh, so practiced them up. They ended up not needing me, but that line of communication that opened the door then, uh, I think at the end of 2020, they asked me if I'd be the bass player for the band. Uh, and I said yes, because at the time they didn't have a bass player. Josh was singing, playing guitar. Wyatt was playing guitar. Logan was drumming. So I come in to be the bass player. I don't think it was a practice or two. My memory's a little shit because of my medicine I take now, but uh, I don't think it was a practice or two that I played bass full time then we went to the josh will play some guitar i'll play some guitar he'll play some bass i'll play some bass and uh we started out i don't know wh what they did before me they were called call it surviving before that they were called family affair because they're all cousins so, right uh the brothers and then why it's their cousin um but when i joined them we were practicing out of a storage unit in centralia and the reason the storage unit is because of how it's zoned or whatever. We could be there making noise 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Right. Cops couldn't do nothing. Uh, it just sucked because we had to, at the time it sucked, and now we're just like, you know what, that's actually pretty good. Um, and I still follow it to this day. Is we didn't do much in the winter. And uh, we kind of followed that even after we got out of the storage unit and into uh Peyton's house. That was our band practice place after. Uh, love you, Peyton. He's been every part of the way since 2015. And it was the most unlikely friendship ever. And he's one of my best friends to this day. Um, but we we pretty much agreed that we'd stop playing after Halloween. And then we'd pick back up in like March or whatever. We had to do that with the storage unit. But then when we moved... Uh, November is really busy for me. My anniversary's the tenth. My daughter's birthday is right after Thanksgiving, and Thanksgiving, so you know we got all that. So it was kind of like, hey guys, I'm going to take November off. You guys do your thing if you want. Uh, and then I wasn't going to do much in December anyways. January is too that kind of crap. Um, so I join. And it's doing great. We played some shows. Uh, we played right beside Anchor Fest where there's a like an old gas station kind of converted mm -hmm. into yeah. a, a building. Uh, we played there while Anchor Fest was going on. We joked around and said we played at Anchor Fest. We played right beside Anchor Fest. Um, we played uh, Pit Fest every year. And then Wyatt accepted the weekend position at his work because it paid 30 bucks an hour. Damn. Damn. Sorry, Wyatt, if you didn't want anybody to know that. Um, I just had, I don't know. Anyways, a lot of money. To, that, to me, that's a lot of money. Um, and that's before the overtime. So we knew that he, that was going to be rough. So that's when we decided we were going to try it as a trio. Um, I had a blast. I mean, if, if they called me today, 
I'd be like, yeah, let's go back and do it. Hell yeah, let's run it back, you know? Um, but we did it as long as everybody wanted to and enjoyed it. It was fun. We got to record a single. Peyton, please release that single. I love you. You paid for it, man. You pay, by the way, Peyton, shout out to Peyton again. Peyton paid for a lot of things during our time of surviving the fall. Uh, paid half of the demo. He paid for all the mastering of it. We we paid for the, uh, just for the recording, but to master it, t-shirts. And Peyton and I both, so I did the first round of t-shirts. And then after that, Peyton took over when Peyton went from roadie to band manager and roadie and go for everything. Uh, Electric Triangle, I think he even played. Um, <laughs> But we we did it as long as we could. I had fun. I'd have kept going, but I get it. It was why it not being there was different. You know, I get it because when Adam wasn't there, you know, so I, I get that. Um, I had a blast, and I like I said at the beginning, I've been enjoying this this what I call like a free agency year. It's been fun, but I'm working with them. If I missed anybody on shout outs. In the story, I apologize. Uh, by the way, none of this would have been happening without my grandparents. I didn't shout them out in the first podcast. I got to in this. When it was in Columbia, they'd pick me up, and Adam as well, and would drive us to Columbia, sit around, wait for us to be done, because we did every other week, and it was like two hours at a time, because it was supposed to be an hour every week to save gas coming from uh, Higby to Columbia. We'd do it, you know, every other week for two hours, and they never said nothing. No, I feel you, because my well, it my parents wouldn't because of prior family things. My dad especially wasn't real wild about me getting into music, uh, so it was my mom's parents that actually bought me my first guitar, and they went in on half of my first one. They went on half. They drove me to all my lessons. It was Wednesday, every Wednesday. Yep. I'd go to guitar lessons, and then we'd have what they called Nick's meal. Meatloaf, mashed potatoes and gravy, steamed broccoli with cheese, stewed cinnamon apples. I was so close to my grandparents. That's why I'm tearing up and crying. They were at every show. When I needed equipment, they no questions asked, paid for it, or helped me pay for it. We're nothing without our support group. Definitely. But they did. they did so much. And like I said, I don't think Adam's parents ever paid for gas for him to go with us. And they bought us lunch every time, every band practice, every show. It's amazing. And just, I wouldn't be here without them. Well, I want to bring up a couple questions here yeah. real quick. Um, twice, we've had we've had two other podcasts this year. Twice your name's been brought up. Yeah. <laughs> Both podcasts, actually. Mm -hmm. So, first one. Um, was the one with uh, Noah from Skull Splitter, and uh, he told me, you know, you know, we talked about how, thanks to you, that's where we're at. Yep. How how that come apart on your end? Um. So you know, we talked so much, mm -hmm. and being in the loop about trying to find a new place when all the bullshit went down, and I I flowed the idea. I was like, well, you know, if, if they don't find anything, but you know, just like. And maybe, and then it was, we need somewhere. You guys have like so many days or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? Matt would have loved this because I was close with Matt. Matt's older than me, but, you know, cut from the same cloth, loved the same music, same sports. Um, when his kids were younger, I, I would help him out, you know, with sports and stuff and could talk hours upon hours with Matt about you know, wine and whiskey and music and life. And, you know, we were just really close friends. And so I was like, Matt would have loved that. Matt would have loved that. And I hit up Noah and I was like, hey, man, if you're looking for anything, these guys really could, you know, you could use them. They could use you, scratch each other's back. And it happened to work out. Yeah, and uh, it's trying to keep that under wraps, but it. I know. <laughs> we we, we kind of shouted you out on there. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. the shout-out. I appreciate the love. I appreciate the shout-out. I was just glad I could help anything. Yeah. As I've said from day one, you know, when I showed up, as the clueless guy in the back here, like, <laughs> you know, with $10,000 worth of gear in my in my car, I'm like, 
Where the hell am I? <laughs> you but weren't I the only one to give us that. No, I fell in love with it though. Yeah. Like I said, when I got out of the car and I hear Manny Petty playing Ballroom Blitz, yeah, because nobody plays that damn song. I love that song. Nobody plays that song. <laughs> yeah, I fell in love with it, man. The the environment, everything about it. No, it's just it's a great. little bit different environment, it but it is. yeah, and it still it still has that same vibe. It does. It does. I'm just a sucker for, you know. Yeah. And also the, just the experience. Because we, I think that was the only show we played that year was the first year of the Battle of the Bands. That was mm-hmm. our only show that year. Mm-hmm. We went in there just because we'd all seen the hype. We all, It was one of the few times we'd all got together and without saying it, it pretty much in unison was like, hey, we should do this. We should play this show. Yeah. But being in Higby, it's cool. It was cool to play Higby. Uh, we did that fill-in show and was glad to do it. Uh, and that was my first time playing Higby. And I think 17 years. My first show was in Higby, at the Higby Fair, uh, which you talk about. You would think, like most places, you want the hometown crowd. Mm -hmm. Oh, you couldn't have drove a fucking needle in my ass with a 10-pound sledge. I was so (laughs) nervous. Well, you're you're a 13-year-old kid. You're going through puberty. Not only all your friends are there, but like everybody who you don't want to be there is there because it's your hometown. So, you know, all your friends... People you don't like, people who you know are gonna make fun of you, even if you go out there and killed it, are gonna make fun of you. Yeah. And you're like, uh, and it's your first show, your first song. You know, I thought I when we did that, I was 13. Besides Adam, I'd only known the other guys three months. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because nobody transferred over, like I said, from Oberly to Columbia. So they're all new. And I think that was the only show with all those guys we played. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the other time that your name was brought up happened to be our last podcast with Midmo Joe. Shout yeah. out to Midmo Joe again every time. It's the realest guy. Check them out, all of them. Oh, he's, Everybody he's with bull right. Yes, yeah. he is. I'm sorry uh, I missed that one, but I was, was sick good. as a dog. We missed you. The funny thing about meeting Midmo Joe is I knew him as Midmo Joe. When I met him at the show, I was like, hey, nice to meet you. Uh, Joe Contrato. I was like, Joey Contrato? Lindsay's little brother? <laughs> and he was like, yeah. And I was like, get the fuck out of here. My sister Alec and your sister used to run around for years all through high school and after. And he's like, no shit. I said, I swear to God. So we had never met, but we had heard of each other right. because our sisters were best friends for years. And he's super cool. We played the show with him. He bought hundred dollars worth of merch. Uh, he's always been kind to us. Uh, was had shows hooked up with us when we were still doing stuff, and possibly in the future. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, winky, winky. Him and I were talking, and he's got some uh, stuff he's working on that involves uh, guitars. Yeah. So maybe, maybe you might hear from the uh, the old Red Lightning on that. There you go. Yeah. You, uh, you have any shows coming up? Um, I don't think we got any shows. Soul Daisy, uh, right now is still in hiatus. Everybody's going through a lot. Like I said, we don't do a lot in the winter, but I, uh, I lost my mother-in-law in October and that's been really rough. My wife was super close with her mother and it, uh, so that was rough. And then I'm working with, uh, those, those guys that used to be, uh, Ancient Stone. So we'll see what comes of that. Yeah. We might play a show at Stickies this year. It, yeah. If we're... If we're there, I'm not going to rush nothing. I'm enjoying this freelance. Well, you know, we'll have Battle of the Bands again, right? Yeah. That might be when it happens. They'll, they'll want to do it beforehand, but that might yeah. be when it happens. Um, Soul Daisy, that's an up in the air thing. Uh, when we're going to do more shows. Uh, and it, it's it's kind of a rotational thing because uh, like it, it's Maddie and I, but we've had Kai come in to you know, jam with us and do shows. Once again, shout out to Kai and Con Cannon. Con Cannon's working on new stuff. Check out Con Cannon on Spotify, Facebook, all that stuff. Shout out to Kai. He's amazing. They're all amazing. They're they're 14 year olds. They're killing it. They're killing it. Check yeah. them out. They, Give them some love. They performed our uh, veterans uh, fundraiser. So you guys know they're yeah. 14. Yeah. I, awesome. I talk about when I was 14 in the band. We weren't that good, guys. We weren't that. Our vocals sucked compared to now. Our vocals sucked. They weren't that great. I was singing for some time, even at the beginning before we got singers. I was a singer. You don't want that. Not me that's a main guy. But even just playing, light years, light years ahead of it. Yeah. While I'm at it, I want to shout out. Hopefully he'll watch it. I'll send him the link. My guitar teacher, Greg Ansel. Greg also taught uh, Logan. And Logan's really close friends with Greg. Yeah. 
Um, Greg's the man. Greg played in a band back in the day called Time Times Two. They were killer. Greg's the greatest guitar player I've ever personally witnessed. And half the time during lessons, because I take an hour lesson every week with him, I will tell one of us goes, I'll be, he'll be showing me playing on the chord, and I'll just... Because <laughs> he's just so great. It's so smooth. He's so great. Um, and uh, he's just amazing. Everybody who I've loved that's local uh, back in the day learned from him. So growing up in Higby, there were two bands. There was Stroker Ace and uh, yeah. uh, Dirt Leg. And uh, now the people from Dirt Leg just joined Stroker Ace over the years. Anyways, back in the day, it was Dirt Leg and Stroker Ace. And all the guitar players from those bands learned from Greg. I didn't know that till I started taking lessons from Greg. And Greg's very particular. He doesn't just, you know, give lessons out. Uh, if you are, anybody's looking for a lesson, though, Greg, Don Ansel, Facebook, the worst he can say is no. That's what I said when I hit him up. We didn't know each other. My dad worked for his dad at the Sheriff's Department for years, but we didn't know each other. We knew of each other. We didn't know each other. Worst he can say is no. It, it It's amazing. I can't say enough great things about Greg. Hey, you guys got anything to add? No. Uh, well, hopefully it's been awesome. if Scotty and I get this ball rolling again. I'm down. And- I'll be, I'll be on the bay. I love playing. So as much as I love guitar, I love playing guitar. Bass is so much more fun because I can relax. With the guitar, I'm always thinking ahead. What, right. How many measures tell the chorus? How many measures tell the verse? How many, you know, this? I'm always thinking. Even when I'm up there doing this or what in my... I'm not lo- I'm looking at you, but I'm not looking at you. I've just, for the, the 19 years I've done this, I know, hey, I have to engage the crowd. In my mind, yeah. I'm keeping timing of... Because I'm going based off the vocals, the drums, like... And trying to keep measurement because if they're off, I'm just going with it. So I'm still following the vocals. Yeah, you know if the timing's off. So like, all we gotta do is find a drummer, I and love, then we start. I'm down. I love playing bass. I can just relax and just. Yeah. It was like at the end every every show I played bass. At the end we we always ended on a what's that damn song? Uh, Wuhan. Yeah. Because it's named after a symbol. Um, I would go down as far as the cable would let me because we're plugged straight into the the and I just headbang because it's just boom 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 so I'm just and I can be free I can start yeah. drinking I can be free because I really don't drink on stage or before the show because I'm like I said I've got to keep everything together yeah, yeah. and I don't want to sound like shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, now it's a lot easier because uh, we've got that snake. And so we put the head up on stage and route it back to the. I think I got to I got to use it with the when we did Soul Daisy because I ran yeah. I ran my cord under the stage so there was no like chip flopping right because I didn't know if anybody else was going to use my amp. Most of the times I've done shows, people's like, "Hey, can we borrow?" It? Yeah, I don't care. Uh, so I ran it under so nobody tripped over it. Um, but yeah, that's super handy, super handy, oh, and, and it makes our setup and breakdown so much easier and quicker. And being able to go full, you know, all year round. Yep. With, with being indoors, because you also have the option to pull it outside. It's Higby. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> there's literally, there, there's a reason why we joke about Higby justice. <laughs> uh, you just, just don't piss off the wrong people. Do whatever you want. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, I guess that about wraps up this episode, y'all. Uh, Nick Boggs, everybody. Yeah. yeah. Thanks are. for having me, guys. Uh, yeah. Hope I didn't forget to shout out anybody else. Uh, uh, with as many as you did, I don't think you did. Also, shout out to my mom. She also did everything for me, too. I love you, Mom. But we're at the end of our video, so do that YouTube thing. Like, subscribe. Comment. Comment, please. Yes. Good, bad, whatever. Well, at our next one, we're going to have uh, Mad Existence down here. That's going to be fun. Love them, guys. Got to share the stage with them. I'm friends with them on Facebook. Check them out on Spotify, for real. Yep. They're amazing. By the, I know they're going to end it, but I love you guys. Anybody who watches this, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. There you go. Well, till next time. I've been singing since I was four years old.
but I was always afraid to get in front of an audience. I was at a science fiction, science fantasy convention. They had a karaoke room. I got hammered as hell. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and a bunch of my friends convinced me to go on stage. And I'm like, well, what the hell song am I going to sing? Tequila. Uh, no, actually, it was uh, Cats in the Cradle. And like I said, I was drunk as a skunk. I mean, you can't go to a sci-fi convention and not. Either driving. get drunk or get laid or both. But I had people out in the audience just bawling. Oh, wow. I'm like, I kind of like this. 